Good afternoon. Thank you, Nita, for that introduction. Uh, this is described as a masterclass. Um, I'm not so sure that's what I'm going to give you. I wouldn't want to suggest that I am. I'm actually going to present really a case study. Um, and, and really, I think what you'll see when I present this is this is not something that came about as part of some grand plan. Um, uh, it, it, events un unfolded and uh, we've sort of arrived at where we are, but we were able to do things along the way, uh, which I, I was very privileged to be able to have the freedom to do that. So I'm just going to talk about this creation of this office uh, and explain how that went. Um, and as, as an overview, uh, these are the things that I intend to touch on that often, um, whatever your plans are, I think this is particularly true perhaps in the public sector, uh, where we're so driven by government policies and changing policies, but I can certainly tell you, and I understand there are some police, um, police people in the audience, that often we get driven by events. Single events can make, uh, bring about huge changes for us. Of course, that also, as well as creating opportunities, creates a number of obstacles, and I'll touch on those uh, from our experience. It also allows um, the, the opportunity sometimes to do things slightly differently. And what I'm going to show you is the way we tackled that. Unusually for the police, um, we embarked on income generation, uh, and I will explain some of that as well. But the golden thread really for us throughout this was having the opportunity to uh, recruit really good people um, and develop our own culture that allowed us to, I, I would suggest, um, provide really good quality service delivery in the things that we were doing. And we grew it from the ground up, if you like. So at every stage, we were able to deal with that. Uh, rapid development, again, this is really much of an overview. This was, um, this was how we started six years ago. We're actually in a porter cabin with four people. Um, today, that's our building, a uh, fantastic um, purpose-built building. So some difference, as you can see, in a short period of time. And that's bespoke building, really. It was a shell that we've been able to uh, design uh, to meet our needs. That was the team as they started. I'm there. I've not many grey hairs there, but as you can see, that's changed a bit in those six years. Um, the reason we're sat out in the garden, what is the garden, is because the porter cabin in the summer was just simply too hot to work in. So one of our um, bright individuals brought in a, a set of garden chairs, and we used to meet outside in the garden. Very nice it was too. That's our staff now. Um, we're about uh, 170 people now. Um, when we did the Sunday Times survey, which um, you know we were staggered to win that award, we were actually 100 people at the time of the survey. So even last year, uh, we've grown since that time, and we continue to grow, which in today's climate is obviously unusual. Funding, well, we started out with a budget, um, capital budget of 112,000. Um, that's grown. And uh, that now is in the region of eight plus million, uh, of which 75%, more than 75% is income generation. So we're driven by events. Um, we, we started out trying to deal with something. Uh, this particular case um, was a case which influenced the way the police service and, and the Home Office were very engaged with this, um, retained DNA and, and indeed fingerprints, but it was about DNA. We used to destroy it. Uh, by accident, we kept it. That actually detected a murder. The courts weren't happy that we'd kept it. I say by accident, they would say we got our procedures wrong. And legislation changed. And that meant we had to make some massive business changes right across the police service in this area, which is, in effect, how we started. Other things, the dreadful murders in Soham, which you'll all know about, um, became a, a massive issue in policing, which was really driven around um, exchange of information between police forces, one police force knowing something, another just a, a few a hundred miles so uh, down the south of the country not knowing the same information. How do you deal with that? Uh, and again, uh, an event that really had a massive impact on the way we deal with this particular type of policing. And, and Sir Michael Bishard um, conducted an inquiry looking at that. Uh, we had a, a crisis around foreign national prisoners. This was. Uh, prisoners who'd been convicted of the most serious crimes, murders, rapes, drug dealing and so on. Judges have said, you do your time in this country and then you're going to be deported. But they weren't deported and that became a very serious issue for government. In fact, the Home Secretary at the time uh, lost his job over it, so that's how serious that was. 
these are things that the unit that we were developing became in, uh, quite closely involved in. And as this, these things were unfolding, we were getting more and more involved in really trying to help. And that's what we were doing, helping fill some gaps that were seen to exist. Um, that was the, uh, the news about the foreign national prisoner crisis. This case is really interesting. This is Michael Mikhail Fornaray. Some of you may remember it goes back to about 2004. This was really a very similar case to the, the Huntley murders that happened in Cambridgeshire, but on a European scale. This was a, an individual who was kidnapping young women, uh, murdering them uh, when he was arrested. Um, he was actually, um, he'd uh, got a young lady in, in the cellar of his house. She was recovered alive, thankfully, but he committed a very large number. And today we don't know exactly how many uh, in total murders across Europe. And what this raised were questions about how um, police organisations across Europe talk to each other, particularly given uh, the nature of our communities now that are made up of so many people from overseas, particularly in the EU context. So what are we doing about exchanging information on that scale? Uh, and then uh, I go back to actually the R versus We are case is a case that started something, and the S and MARPA ruling is a case which um, is effectively unpicking that whole issue around DNA and fingerprints. In itself, a contentious subject because this is really about uh, retaining Biometric information, uh, often fingerprints are mentioned, but the contentious part of that is DNA uh, of individuals who in some cases have not been convicted of any crime. And this was a challenge to that position. It went to the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court said, uh, UK, you're going too far with this. You need to come back from that and have to undo it. And again, um, in fact, I've come this morning from meetings in the Home Office about how we're trying to change back to a different position. So, so really what I'm saying is all these are pretty important big scale events which shaped the way we were developing a unit. It wasn't something that we'd planned for. We wouldn't have expected these things necessarily to happen. Um, what that allowed us to do was to um, build a unit, uh, as I say, from scratch, but create it on the basis of recruiting the people we thought were able to really provide the best skills, um, the best uh, knowledge around these things, and, and also people who could deliver, because often with these event-driven issues, particularly with um, the government requirement where Parliament are asking questions, uh, and saying, well, you know, we need to put this right in a time period. We'd get asked how long uh, we suggest, maybe a year to do that. Uh, we'd be told, well, you've got three months. So, so to deliver against th those demands in which are being examined in Parliament and in the press and all those sort of things, there's huge pressure to deliver. So that sort of creates a can-do culture. Um, it meant that sometimes you have to take a few risks. Uh, we have in, in creating this unit. Uh, you have to be bold. You have to be able to respond quickly. Um, you know, I was asked uh, to put together an operation with 90 people from a um, multi-agency group of people from a number of agencies within a couple of days. Uh, so you have to be pretty agile to pull that together. It allows you, though, to develop staff that can respond to the, that sort of very rapid development. But I put it at the top, and I think the key thing is uh, and I come back to this later on, is we remember, and I guess all of you will be aware of this from your various sectors, that we remember the context uh, uh, of which we are actually operating in. And it would be easy uh, in the world that uh, I've experienced to drift away into other things. For example, we do things with criminal records, we could drift into employment vetting. It's very easy for us to do that, but we always try to maintain um, quite a close attachment to what I would refer to as operational policing. Are we delivering something that's useful in a policing operational context? And I think that's, that's really important. Uh, obstacles. Um, most of you from the public sector will be aware of them, and certainly those from policing will be aware that there are a whole range of things which, although important, work against you uh, when you're actually trying to operate quickly. Um, trying to re recruit people quickly. If you need to have a team of people to work on something uh, within a three-month time span, um, then just recruiting those people in that time is difficult. When we talk about uh, security vetting of these people, it becomes hugely challenging. So all of these sort of issues have to be overcome. And w one of the things that we've had to try to do is to find ways of either taking some risks sometimes, um, actually trying to speed things up, 
uh, maybe even challenging the way we do those sort of things to try to overcome um, some of the obstacles that these things can cause.